The content of this podcast is based on medical fact and evidence-based practice from credible authoritative sources, but is not a substitute for your institution's policies, procedures, common sense, or good judgment. The views and opinions are those of Eric Bauer and Flight Bridge Ed in their entirety. This is the Flight Bridge Ed Podcast, critical care and emergency medicine education for nurses and paramedics. Here's your host, Eric Bauer. Hey everybody, Eric back with you. Coming to you from Hawaii. Um, this is the third co- podcast I've actually recorded from Hawaii and um, actually have a pretty exciting podcast to present. I finally got, after four years, I got my beautiful wife to sit on the podcast with me and uh, we're going to take a look at three separate cases. So this is going to be a nightmare series case presentation and we're going to look at the, these nightmare endocrine cases. So we've got three cases that we're going to present to you. And um, these are cases that she presents all the time. Um, obviously, she's got a higher level expertise. She's a practicing nurse practitioner. And, you know, these are um, pretty complex cases. And so we're going to kind of incorporate not only the endocrine aspect and all the other treatment that goes into these cases, but we're going to kind of dissect the labs. I've had quite a few emails regarding labs and and wanting a podcast related to labs and I think that's a difficult podcast to do so I thought it'd be fitting to kind of incorporate cases that had a lot of lab values and uh, what better way to do that and introduce Ashley to the world I guess and uh, obviously many of you if you've taken our review classes have met her and know how amazing she is so I want to welcome my wife. Oh thanks. That was sweet, even though you have to say it, but either way, it's sweet. Everybody knows. They've heard me on the podcast. I get emotional when I talk about you, so um, it's obviously because I love you. I would like to see like a tear run down there right now. I, I'm would, out of tears. That kind of solidify out. that. And, well. <laughs> All right. So, as I said, um, you know, this is uh, new to her, so uh, she's she's a little nervous, and, and I understand that. Um so we're going to start in and I'll kind of jump in. I'm going to read these cases and then we're going to uh, have her chime in and kind of give her assessment and, and we'll, we'll kind of go back and forth. Um, the first case we're going to do is is a really a train wreck. Uh, it's a 28-year-old female patient and uh, we have an aircraft that's called for a transfer from a very small facility. And we see this all the time. We see these small facilities that really have a difficult time managing uh, these sick patients. And so this patient w- arrived by EMS. She was unresponsive. She was transported. And um, they did a quick assessment. They did labs. And we'll give you guys the labs. Uh, history of type 1 diabetes. She does have a hi- history of anorexia and depression. Uh, current vitals. She's got a blood pressure of 86 over 60. She's got a heart rate of in the 130s and respiratory rate. She's very tachypnic uh, in the high 30s. Uh, she is got a blood sugar about 700 uh, when she arrived, and she has a decreased Glasgow Coma Scale. Uh, they're saying about 8 to 10 at this time. So that's kind of the introduction to this case, and then um, I'm going to let Ashley kind of talk about a few things, and then we'll kind of give you the labs, and we'll start dissecting the labs, the treatment, and we'll try to apply this to our past podcast where we've done Acidosis Rodeo Part 1 and Part 2, um, and kind of intertwine that podcast or those podcasts with this one so at this point actually when we when we kind of arrive on scene and you you get this type of assessment what are the initial differential diagnosis um, kind of thought processes that you should be uh, working towards what algorithm should you be working towards on a patient like this well I mean I think given her past medical history her current presentation of course I mean I think most individuals should automatically go to a DKA type state, um, which includes, you know, worrying about the whole acidosis paradigm that goes along with that and treating that as well as the electrolyte abnormalities that come secondary with that as well. Um, I do think it's, it's good to point out in the beginning that, you know, you have to remember that when the body doesn't have enough insulin, um, the blood glucose is going to increase and that's what leads to that hyperglycemia and then that glucose spilling over into the urine. The glucose that spills into the urine is what causes that initial kind of osmotic diuresis, which leads to that water-sodium loss. Um, 
also, you know, when the body doesn't have the insulin that it needs, it's also going to start to break down those free fatty acids or those fats as that fuel source, which leads to that ketotic or that ketosis type state. I think that's a really good point. And I discussed this in the acidosis rodeo part two of looking at a differential diagnosis. And one of the key indicators uh, when you look at DKA versus HHNK is number one, the blood sugar, right? The blood sugar on the HHNK is going to be very high, um, usually greater than, I believe, 800. Um, and don't quote me on that, but it's going to be very, very high. And DKA patients are, are lower than that. And the big reason, if I'm not mistaken, is because of that fatty acid breakdown and that that actually um, helps keep that blood sugar lower. Is that correct? Well, usually you don't get the higher blood sugars in DKA because of the accumulation of ketones within the body. And that's what quickly leads to that state of metabolic acidosis. And so that's what causes those individuals to tend to seek care quite a bit sooner. They tend to go into that coma type state earlier than an HHNK, which those blood glucose levels can get upwards of, you know, 12, 1500 plus sometimes, depending on how long it's been going on. Um, so then, you know, in DKA patients with that metabolic acidosis, it's usually also aggravated by lactic acidosis that's secondary from dehydration and then poor tissue perfusion from the disease state overall. Okay. So at this point, the patient we know is hypotensive, so hemodynamically unstable, has an associated tachycardia, that's always an ominous sign, uh, and very tachypnic. So kind of matches uh, your differential of, of DKA with those possible coup small respirations. Um, and, and so we got to remember a few things, guys, when we walk into a scene like this. There's some key things is, number one, any patient that is breathing fast and rapid like this always suspect um, an acidosis, a metabolic acidosis. That's a big, big indicator. And we've talked about this a lot on other podcasts of looking at entitled CO2. So it wouldn't be wrong to put her on a side stream nasal cannula entitled CO2 and identify what her entitled is. And remember, if you have a low entitled CO2, always consider the three P's of entitled CO2. Does she have a perfusing pulse? Does she have a perfusion issue, which she does? And what is her pH? Um, and so at this point, we know she's alive. She has a perfusion pulse, um, but her perfusion status is poor and she has a, a rapid uh, tachypnea. So she's breathing fast. So that's where we kind of dive into her labs. And so her labs, uh, and I'll give these to Ashley and she can kind of dissect these. She's got a sodium currently of 130. She's got a serum Oz of 340. She's got an h and of 16 and 60. She's got a potassium of 2.1 and a glucose of 674. So let's talk about those and kind of break those down. And, and I know, again, we've had a lot of emails on lab values. If you're taking these advanced certification exams, um, there's specific exams. I think the CFRN has some pretty heavy questions. And I know the CCP-C is very heavy in lab understanding. So Let's dissect these labs. What are the first things you're thinking of when we when we start with a sodium of 130? So, you know, normal sodium, 135 to 145, and it's going to be dependent upon the lab that you use, the values that they use, but it's always going to be around that state anyway. Um, your electrolyte abnormalities are really the biggest thing that you're concerned about in DKA patients, and that's usually secondary to their loss within the urine as well as alterations between... Um, membranes from that state of acidosis. So as far as the sodium goes, you know, a sodium of 130 may not be alarmingly low per se, um, but it is significant enough to watch. And usually those losses are going to occur secondary to a hyperosmotic state, which, you know, is caused from that excess glucose floating around as well as an osmotic diuresis from that glucose within the urine that's pulling that free water into the urine and it causes that initial loss um, of free water as well as sodium. So is that that reason, that, that hyperosmotic shift like that, is, there, is that the reason why in DKA or any patients with a high glucose that you would want to do a corrected sodium? Yeah, I think it's always important. And normally in DKA states, you'll see a lower sodium than that. It's usually an alarmingly low sodium, um, which, you know, does indicate to a point that they have a, a total body loss of sodium. But we do do a corrected sodium in those states because of that hyper 
osmolar state because of those large glucose molecules that does alter the lab value sometimes that gives us a better indication of where to start as far as sodium replacement goes. Okay, so do you feel like this uh, a corrected sodium is is it a an important aspect of of this patient's treatment, or is that something you would basically start working on the underlying issue and see what happens? I mean, is this something where it's imperative to understand the formula? And and I'll, I'll kind of uh, outline the formula here in a second. But is it is it imperative to understand that and look at that, or is it something that can be done later on? Is that That's a, big a tough focus? one. And um, so yeah. I I think overall I think it is imperative to know the calculation and to be able to kind of get a better understanding of the sodium. I say that just because I think people can sometimes get focused in on those numbers alone. And so using that corrected sodium kind of puts that at bay. Does it change your treatment? No, probably not. You're still going to be really aggressive on your um, replacement of fluids. You know, it may change the fluids that you use. Initially, you're going to use normal saline, things like that, and then you can switch to a dextrose containing half normal saline after they've been hydrated. Um, but I do think it's important in the beginning to at least calculate that and at least address that. You realize that the sodium is low, but using corrected sodium kind of gives that a better, I don't know, a better all feeling, I guess. Yeah. So you have a better, but, yeah, I'm all, know. everybody knows I'm, I want to know all the information I can. I want to be better educated. And so I think anything like this, um, any any other relative information that you can gain from doing these simple calculations, I think, is, is a positive. So I would have to agree. If you remember from our Acidosis Rodeo Part 2 podcast, I talked about the differentials between DKA and HHNK, and we still have a Acidosis, Acidosis Part 3 podcast to do. When we look at a corrected sodium, uh, and Ashley, correct me if I'm wrong, we take the glucose, we subtract 100 from that, we multiply 0 0.016, and then we add the sodium to that answer, and then that is the corrected sodium. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. All right, nice. Pretty good for a medic, huh? We'll leave it at that. <laughs> All right, so what about the serum Oz? This is something that I think a lot of paramedics, um, I think in general, unless you're a paramedic that has uh, been kind of thrust into the critical care realm uh, from an early, um, I guess, age or onset to your, your paramedic career, uh, you know, you, you don't get a lot of that in paramedic school. And, and I was one to where I started really diving into the labs. If I was doing transfers, I would start looking at the labs. And the more you do it and the more you, you know, you see the normals. Uh, but I remember the serum Oz, that was something I really didn't understand. So can you explain kind of what serum Oz means um, and, and what a number of 340 means. Yeah, so normal serum Oz molality is between 275 and 295 respectively. And that's one of the several factors that we look at that regulates the fluid balance between the intracellular and the extracellular fluid compartments. And so essentially it, it measures the amount of chemicals that are dissolved within the plasma or the serum of the blood. Um, primarily that's determined mainly by the amount of sodium within the blood, but also chloride, bicarb, and glucose or other components that kind of make up the measure of the serum osmolality. Okay, so for for the listeners out there that really want to try to grasp on a trick, right? Everybody knows that I'm all about tricks and, and we teach a lot of little tricks in our review class. So I always think of serum Oz as if you have a high number, that means your cells are dehydrated. And if you have a low number on that scale, you're cellular, cellularly hydrated. Is that a good way to kind of think of it, making it simple or is there a better way? No. So I think, yeah, I mean, I think that's easy enough. You know, a high number just indicates that you have a lot of um, chemicals that are dissolved in the plasma. So I always look at it as like sand in water. So the more sand you have, the higher that concentration is, the higher that number is. The more water that you have in relation to the sand, the lower that number is, the lower that concentration is. If that makes sense. Yeah, that makes I think total that's sense. I think that's a great analogy. How you see it, but that's kind of how I envision it. 
So we want a lower number. So this matches basically having a serum Oz of 340. And if normal is 275 to 295, uh, this patient is very dehydrated. Right. So that would indicate that she's got a lot more chemicals dissolved in the plasma in relation to free water. And it's because she's peed off all that free water. Yes. Yes. So it, her, in her situation, that would be secondary to that dehydrated state. Okay. So the next thing we can look at is H and H and an H and H of 16 and 60. If you heard that when I initially said that, that should raise some red flags, right? Your hemoglobin should not be 16 and your uh, hematocrit should not be 60. So does that match her serum Oz being 340? And, and if it does, ex- can you explain to our listeners why? So an elevated hemoglobin and hematocrit, normally we look at more of the hematocrit side of things than the hemoglobin. Um, and again, that's for the indicators of dehydration. So an elevated hematocrit level, especially in relation to a hemoglobin, which I think you've taught on before that there's normally a one to three ratio. Mm-hmm. Um, so your hematocrit is normally three times that of your hemoglobin. And so when that is greatly disproportional, we look at that as more of an indicator of dehydration as well as a state of being dry. Therefore, in her case, again, along with the elevated serum osmolality, that just kind of solidifies that she's currently in a pretty significant dehydrated type state. Okay. Yeah, and that's a great analogy to kind of look at. You know, I often we use the the one in three for Packard blood cell replacement or blood product replacement. Um, but if we did that calculation, 16 times three, that's going to be 48 and her hematocrit is 60. So that is kind of that disproportional uh, range that you're talking about. So we have to remember that it's all based on the concentration, that a lot of these measurements are based on a concentration compared to the total amount of solution. Is that is that a good way to explain it? Kind of similar to what you just said yeah. with the sand in the water. Right. Right. So right. that's exactly what's going on is we have all these um, factors. And so obviously hemoglobin. And so we've got all this hemoglobin and we have less solution. And that's why that hemoglobin number is higher than it should normally be. Right. Yeah. And that's kind of why we look at the, like the hematocrit side of things is because when you look at the hematocrit, that's kind of the, the ratio, the, the volume of red blood cells to the total volume of blood. Okay. Yeah. And so that's why that's usually higher in a dehydrated type state in relation to that total volume. Okay. All right. So the next thing is the the potassium, potassium at 2.1. So this is one of those things, and we we teach on this in the review class and we do these discussions and we've got multiple cases in the review class with Ks this low, just to illustrate the importance, number one, um, uh, illustrate how critical of a situation this is and some kind of transport considerations prior to moving this patient. And so a K of 2.1, what is that telling you? You know, I think with when it comes to potassium and especially in states of acidosis, you have to remember that potassium ions are going to enter the circulation from the cell. So you have a shift from intracellular to extracellular. And so initially those patients will present in a hyperkalemic or an elevated potassium type state. Remember that normal potassiums are anywhere from 3.5 to 5 um, within that range is is considered normal. So it kind of depends on how long the DKA has been going on. You can have patients that present with serum potassium levels at the time of diagnosis that, you know, can be high in that hyperkalemic state. They can be normal or they can even present low, which is in her state at 2.1. She's pretty significantly low. However they present, whether that's high, normal, or low, you have to remember that despite that initial value, that their intracellular potassium stores are always going to be depleted. Um, Even if they present with a K of, you know, 6.2, yeah, that's high, but just remember that that's, you know, inside the cell, that K has now shifted out into the plasma. So that's what you're seeing there. So again, inside that cell is always going to be um, depleted. It does get, this is where I think it gets confusing. I don't know the best way to explain this, but it 
there's a relationship there between potassium and those hydrogen ions. And so you constantly have to have the neutrality between inside the cell and outside the cell. So with the excess hydrogen ions, they kind of push themselves inside the cell, which shoves potassium out of the cell. So that's where you get your initial shift, I guess, of potassium, if that makes sense. Yeah, so when you say you have that shift out, and we know hydrogen ions, that's a that's a, basically what drives our pH. We have hydrogen and bicarb, right? And so hydrogen is related to acid, bicarb is related to your base. You have an abundance of hydrogen, um, then obviously this is what happens. And so we always teach in a metabolic acidosis, you should always expect a higher potassium because of just that. And so when you when you see a patient like this, you should probably expect in a metabolic acidosis to be seeing a high K. And I guess for me, when I think of this, if I see somebody with a normal K in a severe acidosis or a low potassium, that's a scary thing because that's not what you should expect. And we always teach a high K in metabolic acidosis. You don't treat it unless they're absolutely um, you know, symptomatic from that. Treat the metabolic acidosis and the K will come down. You'll have the, the, the shifting of the hydrogen ions out of the cell and, and potassium will go back in to where you have that intracellular uh, potassium. So in this case, being a 2.1, what is the cause of that 2.1? What happens to cause that to go low in the, in a metabolic acidosis? Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's a good point. So initially, you know, we do want to see that K high. And when you see a K of 2.1, that is very alarming, given the fact that their intracellular stores are, con you know, are always depleted and now their extracellular stores are depleted. And so, Initially, you have that shift out, you have hyperkalemia, but due to that osmotic diuresis and that constant urinating that these patients are doing, they're losing those electrolytes through that urine, and that includes um, potassium as well as sodium. So that's where the majority of the potassium is lost is through that, that diuresing that's going on. Okay, awesome. So when you look at the transport considerations, and, and this is always one of those things that I really want to point out that that we have to be an advocate for our patient. And you're gonna arrive on scene uh, at these small facilities. And, and we're gonna touch on some treatment uh, where the hospital started treatment and some kind of mistreatment here in a second. But when you see a K this low, would you agree that you don't transport this patient without starting some type of potassium first? Oh, absolutely not. I mean, you can't start treatment on this patient period without addressing the K. Um, you know, you got to remember that as soon as you give insulin, you're going to drive that potassium back into the cell. And so with a K of 2.1, you really have nothing left to drive. So, it, you know, giving that patient fluid and insulin first thing without addressing that K is you're basically going to collapse that patient. You're going to kill them. Um, you know, it's a good thing to remember that when you have patients in hyperkalemic states, that part of your part of your protocols are giving those patients glucose and insulin for that very reason. That insulin drives that potassium back into the cell, allows you to decrease that potassium until you can get rid of it. Um, and so the same is true here. You give them insulin, you're going to drive that K right back into the cell, which they do not have. So you have to address the, um, the potassium very, very early on. And so kind of to elaborate on that and, and add to that is one of the biggest treatments in a DK patient is volume. Is that, is that correct? And so she is extremely dehydrated. We, we've already illustrated that in her identifying her sodium, her serum Oz, her H and H, um, all those kind of lead you down the road that she definitely is severely dehydrated. And so we've got to replace that volume. And just like we talked about in the, you know, H and H, uh, looking at the solute, based on solution, potassium falls in that same same role. So if we have a K of 2.1, we start dumping the volume in, we're going to dilute that number out even further. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, to a point, you know, you, you have to consider doing those together, I guess. Sure. Um, most of the time in DKA patients or patients, providers want to get so focused in on the glucose and fixing the glucose. And really that's not a significant value to even consider. I mean, we watch it with managing these patients and treating these patients, but we don't focus on the glucose, even if it comes up as 700. 
you know, your main focus is on the, the state of acidosis, the hypokalemia, the state of dehydration. And so if you don't focus on those, you're basically going to collapse your patient. Um, you know, because the same is true is when you start giving insulin in these patients, you're going to force that water kind of to go back into the cell as well. So you're going to cause a circulatory collapse if that's not addressed. So I do think the best way to go about that, especially with a low cave 2.1, um, is, you know, giving the fluids and the potassium concurrently, doing them both at the same time. Okay. So this has come up in other in some of our courses uh, around the United States where, where we, we get into these dialogues, and, and I think it's great and it's neat to see. Um, and you, you really get these dialogues between the nurses, and, and I think that's great. You, you know, you get an ICU nurse that will kind of illustrate one approach, and you get maybe an ER nurse that illustrates another approach. Uh, we even had physicians in our courses that, you know, you get an ICU uh, intensivist and you get an ER doc, and they're going to think of this completely different. So... Um, when you look at these patients and you look at how we treat a patient with a K of 2.1, um, do you give K PO? Do you give K IV or do you give K via an NG or OG tube? And the, the big determining thing that, that often bring, gets brought up is the urine output. Um, you know, do they have current urine output? Are they in acute renal failure? And does that play into your decision on how to give this? So, yeah, I think that's a very complicated kind of paradigm um, that's often debated. And it all does depend on who you who you ask. But the problem is that in this case, this patient is severely dehydrated. So she really has nothing to put out. So basing, replacing that K on urine output doesn't really seem like much of an argument, really. Um, with a K that low, you really can't say, well, let's give her a couple, a couple of liters and see what she starts doing at that point, because then you risk dropping that K even further and being even more detrimental to the patient. So my view on that is I would do them both at the same time. You know, I kind of look at it as what's going to kill her first. Sure, she's in acute renal failure, secondary to a dehydrated state. So, you know, yeah, she's going to have problems probably with the potassium um, as far as regulation. However, if we don't give it, if we base it on her output and we start giving fluids and we drop that K even further, you know, you risk killing your patient cardiovascular wise. Um, it's much easier to pull potassium off than it is to put it in. You can do it a lot quicker shifting potassium around, pulling it off, then you can, you know, giving 20 to 40 milliequivalents IV every hour, whatever your protocol says. Um, with a K that low of 2.1, I would absolutely be giving it IV and via um, NG OG tube if she's unconscious. And I think that's a good point. I think the teaching point here, guys, is You've got to be a patient advocate, and, and most HEMS agencies, um, you know, I, I've worked for two of the largest, and, and there is, uh, you, you know, you're not going to carry potassium. If you do, that's, you know, that's great. Um, I think, though, that you need to ask for it. Um, ask the referring physician, say, hey, you know, the K is this. Um, could you give us some some potassium to take with, with us and, and then start it in? Uh, in route. Um, you know, if they were reluctant to give that to you or if they didn't want to give that to you, this is such a pivotal thing that I would immediately call your medical director and get the medical director on the phone with the actual referring physician. Um, I would not leave with a patient without potassium. That's how imperative this is. All right, so let's move on. Let's uh, really quickly talk about the ABGs. I think we've hounded on ABGs um, over, I mean, many, many podcasts. So I'll kind of touch on these really quick and then we'll look at the treatment aspects of what the hospital started and, and hit a few fine points before we move on to the next case. Um, her current ABG, she's got a pH of 7.14. She's got a CO2 of 20 and a bicarb of 15 with a base excess of negative 14, which means she has a base deficit of 14. So we know that that is a partially compensated metabolic acidosis. The reason why it's partially compensated uh, if you don't remember kind of how this works is always look at your pH. If your pH is less than 7.35, you know that you have an acid. 
uh, your bicarb is low also uh, because it's less than 22. And so that's the, that's the way I look at this. I look at my pH. I look at my bicarb. I know I have a metabolic acidosis. And our normal compensation, the normal way we compensate is based on our respiratory buffering system. Obviously, our carbonic acid buffering system comes first, and then our resp respiratory buffering system comes next. So that's why the patient is in those Kussmaul respirations. She's trying to protect the pH by having that tachypnea, uh, which blows off CO2 and doesn't allow that pH to drop any further. So currently, she is in a partially compensated metabolic acidosis. Again, we need to protect that respiratory rate. Her respiratory rate right now is in the high 30s, so we've got to be very, very careful not to drop that respiratory rate, um, and that's going to be based on how we deal with the airway uh, when that time comes. So let's talk really quickly about the, the kind of the big issue with this patient, and we see this all the time, is they started this insulin on her at 12 units per hour. So she is a 47 kilo female ideal body weight so what are what are the problems here all right her sugar initial glucose um, was over 700 right now at 674 and you are told when we arrive that over the last hour so she's been at that hospital for an hour they've got the glucose all the way down to 228 so let's discuss that so i think you know initially you got to talk about your insulin drips um, when you're ready to start Insulin, always remember it should be at 0 0.1 units per kilo per hour. So in a 47 kilo patient, she should be between 4 and 5 units per hour. So essentially they had her at three times her normal or what should be um, her starting insulin drip. Yeah, and, and that's, a, that's a bad thing. And I can't tell you how many charts I've read. And it's always from very rural areas where the insulin dose is that high and the sugar is dropped that much. So remember, we don't want to drop the glucose more than 100 per hour or 50 per 30 minutes. And that's probably a pretty standard protocol. And I think Ashley hit on a very important point uh, about 15 minutes ago where she talked about it's not the focus on the glucose. We shouldn't be worried about the glucose. Um, and here's my kind of spill on that. We got to remember that we don't have, I should say, most HIMSS agencies, most critical care ground agencies do not have the ability to do labs in transport. They don't have an ISTAT machine. It's usually those hospital-based programs that have that ability. So unless you have the ability to do um, those labs where you can assess a glucose, if our glucose when we arrive at hospital is over 600, like this patient is, our glucose monitors any glucose monitor that you're going to see on a, on a helicopter or an ambulance, it reads high above 600. And so here's my kind of thought on this. Why are we worried about the insulin? Don't worry about dropping the sugar a drop because let's say it's 800 and you have an insulin drip going, even if it's corrected at, let's say, five units per hour. How can you evaluate that you're not dropping that sugar more than 100 per hour? There's no way to do that. You could drop at 200 over 30 minutes and still your glucose monitor just might hit 600. And so I'm of the mindset, unless you have a definitive number of less than 600, all the insulin should be turned off. That's my mindset because there's no way to evaluate that. What do you think about that? And you can, you can disagree. That's fine. That's what this is about. You Cause can, you know, that's what my look is right look. now. She's giving me a look. Like, guys. Is, it, is it okay to disagree on your own show? Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, so I, I have to disagree with you um, in certain aspects. So I agree that if you do not have the ability to check an insulin and make sure that you're not dropping that, um, or I'm sorry, glucose, and you're not dropping that more than a hundred or so an hour, then yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a huge consideration um, just because of the adverse effects that you get from dropping the glucose way too fast. However, I will say that saying no insulin whatsoever is your best bet, I don't agree with that. Um, the reason being is that most of these individuals have gotten into a DKA state secondary to a lack of insulin. And so the body has gone into this mode, the survival type mode, to break down these free fatty acids as their source of energy. And so when you take that insulin completely out of the picture and you 
don't give them any insulin at all, they quickly go right back into that state. And so you're looking at possibly worsening your state of acidosis that you may have already started improving. And so my suggestion in that situation would be cut the dose in half. So if normally she's at, let's say, five units an hour, um, cut it down to, you know, two and a half to three units, you know, just to ensure that you're at least giving her some insulin, not depleting her or not, you know, causing her to not have any insulin whatsoever. Um, So that would just be, you know, my take on it is, you know, maybe cut it down, cut it in half just to ensure that you're not dropping it too fast, but also to ensure that she's getting that insulin to prevent her from going back into that gluconeogenesis type state that she was just in. No, I think that's a valid point. And and I I guess looking at it from that perspective of of dropping it, cutting it in half, um, I think is is valid. And and I I don't disagree with that. I guess I hadn't really thought of it that way. And I think my my fear is, is... is just not knowing, not knowing those numbers and, and not knowing, you know, how long have the labs been um, since they were taken? You know, are we talking about two hours? And in this example here, we have a blood sugar drop from over 700 down to 228 uh, in an hour. And so obviously, um, when we look at this and we'll kind of give you the, the backstory of this, this patient ended up having um, cerebral edema um, and, you know, that's uh basically led to her uh, herniating and and, and dying. And, um, you know, the flight crew did everything they could to try to, you know, get her to a definitive facility that could take care of her, but she, she didn't do well at all. So is there anything you want to kind of elaborate on that? No, I mean, I think that's, I think that covers it. I think, you know, again, you got a very valid point with checking, um, checking the glucose and, you know, it's probably just a difference of looking at treating the patient, within the next hour versus treating this patient within the next, you know, three to four days and how, you know, the sequelae of one event can cause setbacks over the next 72 hours. Um, But no, I think, I think you covered it all. No, and I think that's true. And I think, you know, she has the mindset, obviously she used to be a flight nurse and she has a mindset now of, you know, emergency medicine and and kind of that more um, looking at it more long term. And I think in the HEMS industry, when you kind of combine a flight nurse and a flight paramedic and you combine their their different expertise, um, I think for a paramedic, that's the biggest curve. And I've said this many times on on other episodes that we have to start thinking about uh, long term. What is this going to do hours to days from now instead of looking at acutely? And I think that that's a, a, a very valid uh, point. So let's go to case number two. Case number two is uh, a very interesting case. We have a 56 year old male. He was admitted for three days of history of fever and general malaise and weakness. Uh, they did blood cultures on him and he's positive for, for uh, strep uh, pneumonia. Um, over the last 24 hours, his urine output has decreased and he's right now less than 0.5 mils per kilo per hour. Uh, his most recent labs, he's got a sodium of 126, he's got a chloride of 98, he's got a serum Oz of 260, and a urine-specific gravity of 1.040. So let's kind of dissect this case, and what are some things you get this this patient that comes in to your ED, and you decide to transfer him out? What are, what are some kind of initial differential diagnosis that you're thinking of? Um, well, I mean, of course, you know, just reading the first line fever, you might automatically think infection, you know, infection from what, um, increased weakness. Weakness is always golly. It's one of those presentations that you hate seeing because it can be a myriad of things. It, there's not one thing, um, you know, that I would hone in on, on weakness alone. I mean, as far as electrolyte abnormalities, um, Looking at his labs, his urine output, things like that, of course, I'm going to want to consider is the urine output secondary to a dehydrated type state, or is he retaining fluid for some reason? He's not, you know, whether it's a kidney issue, um, neurogenic type issue, you know, just wondering about that. And of course, the sodium of 126, so your hyponatremic state, then I begin to worry, is that because of a fluid retention? You know, is that why his urine output is low and now we have a dilutional hyponatremia? Um, so it's kind of breaking all those down and going from there. Um, you know, in this case, 
just going ahead and diagnosing him. This this guy does have the SIADH, which is secondary to his pneumonia that he was diagnosed with. And looking at SIADH, hyponatremia is one of the most common fluid and electrolyte abnormalities that we'll see. So I think it's important in this situation as well to kind of review what ADH or antidiuretic hormone is um, and how it works within the body. So remember that ADH is formed within the hypothalamus and it's stored in the pituitary gland for whenever we need it. Normally the body releases that in response to increases in um, like intravascular osmotic pressures, hypovolemia, or decreases within the pulse pressure. But it can also be released with fear, pain, anxiety, and that's why you'll see SADH a lot of times secondary in um, high stress ICU type state situations can be from from that release of that you know that stress that anxiety on those patients. Um, regardless, the whole function of ADH within the body is just to to increase the permeability within the kidneys to to water. So. You know, it causes less free water to be excreted within the urine, causes the urine volume to decrease, and then the concentration of urine to increase. So what made you kind of focus in on that differential diagnosis? I mean, I think when I first read a case like this, and I think this would be a a classic question you would see on an advanced certification exam, when you read a 56-year-old male admitted for weakness, fever, he's got positive cultures, he's strep pneumonia, he's got decreased urine output, you're automatically focusing on sepsis. I mean, that's the initial differential that I'm thinking of, that he is septic and he's going down kind of a bad road. But when you look at the sodium of 126, um, serum Oz of 260, remember guys, serum Oz norm is 275 to 295 with a lower number, meaning there's more water present. Um, And then I want you to explain kind of the urine specific gravity and what that means. But what was the key thing that focused focused you in on on the S I A D H? Yeah, so I think that's you know that's key that you're always thinking sepsis, given his fever, given you know his diagnosis and things like that. But his clinical picture doesn't fit that. The fact that he's got a low sodium, a low chloride. Um, a, you know, a low serum Oz, which indicates that he's got way too much free fluid in concentration to the solute, so not enough. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? He's not chemicals. Yeah. yeah, so not enough chemicals dissolved within that plasma, um, indicating that he's holding on to all of this fluid, and that just does not fit a sepsis patient, which we would expect to be kind of the opposite of that. You know, we have to focus a lot on fluid resuscitation with sepsis and things like that because of the shift of fluid, um, but they don't present it with that dilutional hyponatremic state that you see here. So a normal urine-specific gravity is 1.005 to 1.030, and essentially that's just the concentration of the urine. Um, And so a a high urine-specific gravity is just that, that the urine is very, very concentrated. Like syrup. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's going to be very, very dark in color. It's going to be um, very little, like you're not going to have a whole lot of urine output. So, yeah, if you went and – syrup, is that what you said? That's you got me is. distracted by syrup now because all I can picture yeah, is – she loves pancakes. <laughs> loves, loves her some pancakes. She had some pancakes this morning. So I really she... wouldn't compare those because really what comes <laughs> into my mind is like somebody sitting down and, and peeing syrup. That's really all I can picture right now. Um, yeah, so anyway, um, so those those individuals with the high urine-specific gravity, very, very dark urine, a lot of times, you know, foul odor to the urine because it's very, very concentrated with um, with the chemicals dissolved within the urine. Okay, awesome, awesome. So what's going to be the, the main treatment for this patient? Fluid restriction, first and foremost. I mean, that should be the one thing that providers don't do is give them more fluid. They don't need any more fluid. They're already drowning in their own fluid. Um, Of course, you're going to have to fix the underlying problem, so you have to treat the pneumonia as well. And then you can also give these patients Lasix just to counteract that, that fluid overload state. 
So can you give one like kind of tip as far as, you know, they get this type of patient, what would be the one key lab or one key thing that, that you could focus in on? Because I think when you tell a pre-hospital provider to completely withhold volume, that goes against everything you're taught. And I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I think we're very, you know, initially when you're taught in, in school, you're taught, you know, see this, do this. And, and when you get into the critical care realm, you have to really critically think and kind of diverge through all these different labs, these, all this diff, new information that, that you're not used to looking at. So um, for me, and, and, and I want your view on this, if I saw the serum Oz low like this, the sodium low like this, uh, with that low urine output like that, that for me, that would clue me in. But is there anything else that you can kind of point out for, for the audience? No, I think you do have to critically think. So you have to look at your labs. You know, a lot of times what comes along with this is that you look at your sodium and you go, okay, well, he's hyponatremic for what reason? So you got to have to figure that out. Is it a dehydration type state? Is it, you know, a dilutional state as in the SIADH? What's causing that sodium to be low? And then you, you kind of have to look at their volume status, whether they're hypovolemic, euvolemic, hypervolemic, which is extremely... Um, in depth and really is not something that pre-hospital providers are probably going to do. So it doesn't even warrant having that massive conversation, but essentially looking at their serum oz. And so if their serum oz is low and their sodium is low, then you know you're looking at a dilutional hyponatremic state. And so you kind of have to go down that aisle and say, okay, well, what would be causing this patient to be retaining so much fluid? Um, You know, and it's one of those things that going through your differential diagnoses as well. And I'm sure nobody includes SIADH. Well, I say normally nobody includes SIADH in their differential diagnosis list. Yeah, that's um, way down the line. Yeah. But it is. It, it occurs a lot more commonly than what people probably even diagnose with. Um, it's probably one of those things that you don't see as much pre-hospital unless you're transporting a patient. Um However, it is, it occurs a lot more frequently than is probably caught on in the pre-hospital environment. And so I do think it, it warrants, you know, just critically looking at those labs as well as the patient presentation and trying to put those together. All right. So let me flip this. Just, just, you, you caught me kind of curious. Um, and I know you've taught on kind of something opposite. Let's say this patient with a fever, same presentation, you don't have the labs, but with a fever, uh, fever brings on free water loss. So with free water loss, that's going to ha- give you a, 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 a big deal on, on, the, on the other side. So can you talk about the free water loss aspect and what you would see different in the labs? Um, or is there anything major that you would see? Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, if it was a totally different situation, if it was a, you know, three day history of fever with, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, you know, all those things that cause that free water loss, then this, this state is going to be completely opposite. You're looking at a dehydrated state with that, which would give you a high sodium level, which would give you a high serum oz level, um, indicating that dehydration. So the fever alone in this individual is not significant enough to put him into that free water loss state that would lead to a dehydration, if that makes sense. Yeah, Normally yeah. it's fever associated with another source of free volume, free water type loss. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Let's do our last case. Uh, this is kind of a cool case. Uh, so in this case, we have a, a pediatric patient and we know that, you know, everybody kind of cringes when you see pediatric patients. We've got to remember guys, um, You know, there are some really excellent courses out there. I've talked about one of the courses that I became an instructor for called Pediatric Fundamentals of Critical Care Support. If you ever see that advertised anywhere, um, you know, it's it's actually written by the Society of Critical Care Medicine, phenomenal critical care. It's actually a physician level course on pediatrics, and it really will make you more confident. We have to just look at kids, even though there's some differences in kids, but kind of think of them as adults. I mean, even though they're not, but that kind of is, is, is a mind game you have to play with yourself and, and something that I've kind of learned over the years. So this patient is a six-year-old boy. Uh, he currently weighs about 20 kilos. Uh, 
He was involved in an MVC motor vehicle accident three days ago and sustained an isolated head injury. And he's got a noted intraventricular hemorrhage, right? So that's a very ominous head injury. Anytime you have an intraventricular hemorrhage, that is not good. Approximately two hours ago, uh, he suddenly had an increase in ICP, and his current ICP is 29 to 30 millimeters of mercury. Uh, we know that a normal ICP is anywhere from 0 to 15, 0 to 20, depending on the textbook you read. And his current mean arterial pressure, or MAP, is 52. Um, you're called to transfer this patient, and uh, they gave him some volume. They did initiate an epidrip uh, because he is hypotensive. Uh, and he is improving. Within the last two hours, he is well, and his urine output is uh, has increased to about 150 mils per hour, and that's approximately 8 mils per kilo per hour total, so pretty big urine output. So why don't we kind of dissect this case, and then I'll kind of jump in periodically. What do you think on this presentation? What's the differential? You're called to transfer this patient. What are some key things that you're you're worried about? Well, I mean, of course, we know why his ICP, you know, is increasing. Well, somewhat, we know why. Um, but, of course, I want to know, you know, why all of a sudden his urinal output has increased dramatically. Honestly, you know, you think of increased urinary output, you think of, you know, overhydration type state, polyuria, you know, secondary to a diabetic type state, so I'm going to rule out diabetes. Um, and then, of course, you're always, well... You will be after this podcast. Always be considering diabetes insipidus, which is DI, which <laughs> is not anything associated with diabetes mellitus, but um, does cause that increase in urine output. So, you know, it, it does warrant at least considering that as well, given his high stress state that he's in and probably in a pediatric ICU, um, neuro ICU type state, and the head injury alone. Those are two big indicators that puts these patients at an increased risk for diabetes insipidus. Okay, awesome. So that's a, that's one of those those big things. So let's talk about the ICP real quick. Remember, an ICP, right? You don't want anything greater than, than 20. And so when we look at ICP, we have to also consider the blood pressure, right? And we, we look at the blood pressure more specifically in trauma and in head injuries in neuro from a mean arterial pressure. What's the MAP blood pressure? And we do that because we have to evaluate what's called the cerebral perfusion pressure. And we've talked about this on previous episodes. I did a three-part series on traumatic brain injury and the different types of head bleeds. So if you haven't listened to that, check that out. But for pediatrics, we don't want any cerebral perfusion pressure less than 60. So to identify a cerebral perfusion pressure, we take the MAP blood pressure and we subtract the ICP from it. So we got a MAP of 52 and we have an ICP of 30. That is bad, right? So what is our cerebral perfusion pressure? 22. Did I do the math right? 22. 23, but... 23-ish, Who's yeah. counting? Yeah. Always got to be somebody in the crowd. <laughs> Off by one. Well, um, <laughs> So that is a very, very bad, bad, bad thing. And so that brings in... They gave volume and they started an epidrip, which I think is great. But we have to remember... One period of hypotension, one period of hypoxia. This is hypotension. This is a bad situation. So this patient's cerebral perfusion pressure is 23, needs to be greater than 60. So we're way, way behind. Um, this is a bad, bad thing. So we have to remember a concept called HHH therapy. And HH therapy, HHH therapy is kind of a three-step process. Number one, we want to make our patients hypervolemic. So we want to give them volume. They actually started volume, but we need to really evaluate how much volume have they received. Uh, remember, pediatric patients, 20 mils per kilo. Keep giving them those boluses. They can handle a lot of volume. Don't stop until you get improvement. The next thing we do is we make them hyperdynamic. And making them hyperdynamic is giving them an inotropic medication. So giving them dopamine or dobutamine for that, for that regard based on this patient's presentation would be absolutely appropriate. Um, Epidrip would be absolutely fine as well, and that kind of hits on make the patient hypertensive. And we're not making them massively hypertensive, but we got to raise that blood pressure up. And so start a presser. So whether that's levofed, whether that's an epidrip, whether that's neosinephrine, you need to do something to get that pressure up. Um, when we look at 
this situation, what are some things that we're going to do treatment wise? I mean, is there anything we can do treatment wise for this, for this little guy? Um, when we look at his labs, um, they give you labs and his current sodium is 155, his chloride is 114, serum Oz is 320, and his urine specific gravity is 1.005. So what is that telling you? Is that just kind of adding to your initial differential? Yeah, I think it is. You know, so again, it, it's important to consider that DI as well as SI, SIDH are caused by um, alterations in the antidiuretic hormone, so the ADH. Um, whereas in DI, you know, this is either from a deficit of ADH or the kidneys aren't responding to the ADH as well. And so, you know, you have to look at your presentation as well as your labs and try to put those together. In this case, he's suffering from a central or neurogenic type DI. The other type would be a, more of a nephrogenic DI, which would be secondary to a kidney issue. Um, in DI, polyuria or that increase, that sudden increase in urine output is normally the first sign that you're going to see. And so, again, you know, it's, it's taking your presentation and trying to remember those things and putting all those things together. You know, looking at your labs, you're going to have a low urine osmolality. Um, your urine-specific gravity is usually low, indicating that you know, you're losing a lot of fluid in that urine. So that urine is going to be very clear in color. They're going to be, you know, urinating large amounts very, very frequently. Um, Hypernatremic state, so that serum sodium of greater than 145 indicates a dehydrated state, um, as well as that serum Oz that's greater than, you know, 295, 300, which in this case is 320. Again, indicating that you have that loss of free fluid, that free water, that increase in chemicals or solutes within the plasma. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I... I as difficult as it is, I think it's more just kind of hammering in on critical care thinking and taking your presentation and really trying to put those labs with that presentation in order to come up with the correct diagnosis for these patients. So, you know, I agree 100%. I mean, I think if, if for those of you out there working on your labs and your understanding of labs, if you can focus in on your sodium and your chloride and your, your you know, your H&H &H and your serum Oz, um, your ABGs, um, you know, looking at just, just simply start with your white count and, and, and look at that and, uh, little things like that and build on that and just remember exactly what you saw in these cases, you know, in this patient, this patient has got a huge amount of urine output. So their, their concentration their sodium is high, their chloride is high. It doesn't mean they have a high, all of a sudden a high amount of sodium and chloride. It means that the concentration based on the overall amount of a solution is much higher than it was before. Um, one of the things I want you to kind of, or I want to kind of clear up because this is always something that confuses me in my mind is when we say a serum Oz, if a serum Oz is low, you said serum Oz is low. That means that we are cellular dehydrated. But when you look at the range, we have 275 to 295. This patient has a higher number of 320. So it's, it's opposite of what you kind of think. Does that, does that kind of make sense to what I'm saying? If, if a patient that has a high serum Oz number means that they're dehydrated, but it's, does that, am I saying that correctly? Yeah. So, you know, yeah. So a higher serum Oz indicates more solutes in the plasma and not enough of that free fluid. So they've lost that free fluid secondary to that dehydrated state. So it's a low, that's a low reading, but a higher number, if that makes sense, guys. That's just one of those things that's kind of flipped in my mind where you normally think of a low as a low number on a range. If I were to think of this normally, if somebody said serum Oz of 295 or 275 to 295 and, and somebody said a low serum Oz, I would think of two, 275 being low in that range, 295 being high. We have to remember, though, it's reversed in this lab. A high number means you're, you're dehydrated. A low number means you're more hydrated, essentially. So in this patient, what's the treatment? What is your, what is your kind of uh, go-to treatment in this, in this patient? Well, mainstay of treatment is, you know, correction of the underlying problem. So your two main medications for that are vasopressin and 
um, desmopressin or DDAVP, which is a newer drug. It doesn't have near the side effects of that vasopressin does. Vasopressin you'll still see used quite often, especially for acute DI-type states, um, as long as the patient doesn't have any contraindications to the use of vasopressin. DDAVP you'll see used a lot more um, in chronic DI-type states or patients who have contraindications to the use of vasopressin. Um, but then again, it's, you know, giving those medications, which both of those act as a synthetic ADH within the body. So the body will respond to those medications just as it would normally to antidiuretic hormone. So it'll start holding on to that fluid, trying to equalize those labs out. Um, the biggest thing is just really monitoring hyponatremia. So after you give those medications, after you're holding on to those fluids, you know, really make sure that that sodium is not dropping fast and that you're not putting that patient into a hyponatremic state, which is seen a lot of times with both the treatment of SIDH and DIs, the patients will go the complete opposite of where they just were. Okay. Well, guys, I think that's, uh, that's going to wrap up this podcast. It's, uh, we've kind of hit an hour and I know that's a little longer than a lot of our Flatbridge Ed podcasts. Uh, a lot of you guys like these longer podcasts cause I know you drive a couple hours to work and that's cool. Um, Hopefully you enjoyed this case uh, or all the three of these cases and you enjoyed Ashley being on the podcast. Um, um, I, I just want to say, you know, on behalf of, uh, of all of our listeners, I'm so uh, proud to have you as, as my partner at Flatbridge Ed and my, and, my, and my wife. And you really do so many things behind the scenes. And I, I say this all the time in our, our review class that uh, we truly could not, we wouldn't be where we are without you. And... Um, I'm very thankful for your dedication to this cause. Oh, thank you. So on behalf of Ashley and uh, the Flybridge Ed team, uh, we will talk to you soon. This has been a production of the Flight Bridge Ed podcast, leading the way in pre-hospital critical care and emergency medicine education.